All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to day two and the afternoon session of the Women Blaze Trails Festival. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for the weekend. Uh, yesterday was the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And to celebrate uh, last year, we launched a three day virtual festival featuring women in science, exploration, conservation, adventure, engineering, photography, filmmaking, and more from across the planet. So the goal of this festival is simple. We want to celebrate incredible women doing incredible things around the world, day in and day out. So all weekend long, uh, we'll be meeting women on the front lines of their fields, showcasing their stories, work, challenges, adventures, research, and expeditions. So this festival is organized by Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Our goal is to inspire the next generation of scientists and explorers. We do this by bringing those on the front lines of science, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond through virtual guest speakers and field trips. Since 2015, we've hosted well over 3,000 live events, connecting a half a million students with scientists and explorers in 95 countries. And the cornerstone of what we do uh, is that it will, it is and always will be free for classrooms everywhere. So if you haven't visited, check out our website, exploringbytheseat.com. This is one of our favorite months because in February, we kick all the men out and we host women in science, exploration, conservation from all over the world. We've got probably about 45 live events there for classrooms to take advantage of. Uh, and if you visit our YouTube channel, you can find thousands of previous events you can tune into with your students, with your kids at home, or just for your own general interest. All right, so our, our last event took us into the ocean and this event is gonna keep us there. So we're gonna get to meet Martina uh, Capriati. She is an Italian marine biologist and scuba diver. She uh, was born and grew up along the Adriatic Sea coast where she developed a passion for the sea. During her first research year, she focused on chemical pollution and its effect on marine organisms. Thanks to a grant from the National Geographic Society, she investigated microplastics and chemical pollution in the Adriatic Sea. She was awarded uh, as one of the three Sky Ocean Rescue Scholars in Europe for this project. She's currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Connecticut, where she's directing her interest now to investigating how marine filter feeders interact with the ecosystem. Let's bring Martina in live with us right now. Hey, Martina, great to see you. Hi, Joe. I'm so happy to be here today and celebrate with you this uh, wonderful day. <laughs> All right, amazing. Well, we're thrilled to have you joining us live. Yeah. I'm going to disappear for uh, a little while. We want to get to know you. We want to hear your story, and then we'll do a little Q&A action together. Absolutely. See you later. There you go. You should see my screen, right? We got it. Looks oh, good. Oh, great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Joe and all the audience. Uh, and thanks, Joe, for the presentation. So I don't need to add uh, anything more. But I want to start with my story. So what exactly bring me over here? So I'm currently, uh, I'm Italian, but I'm currently presenting from USA. Indeed, uh, I'm a postdoc researcher at University of Connecticut. And, uh, but actually my story started in Italy, uh, in a little town called uh, San Benedetto del Tronto along the Adriatic Sea. It's a really, really nice town. And I suggest you to visit if you happen to travel to Italy. And so I, met the sea since uh, after a few days after I was born and I swim since uh, I was really, really young. Uh, and so I always had a special passion for the for the sea. And uh, when I was a teenager, I uh, became a lifeguard. I started to scuba dive and uh, it was during that those first dives that I like was literally mesmerized by the beauty of that uh, underwater world, basically. Um, and so this was probably the spark that uh, made me, uh, that pushed me to like study uh, marine biology in the future. But you know, when you 
uh, go underwater. Uh, it's also um, really common to find uh, the human footprint. So a lot of debris, a lot of pollution. And so this was another like aspect of my uh, teenager experience that pushed me to study uh, marine pollution. Uh, specifically during my first years um, as marine biologist, I uh, focus on uh, chemical pollution. So it means all these chemical compounds that are toxic for life, but that are like highly present in uh, uh, marine waters. Uh, many of them that are the most uh, um, preoccupied uh, are the um, uh, persistent organic pollutants uh, that are pollutants that are called persistent because they are able to persist for a really, really long time in the marine environment. And they can also accumulate inside the tissues of uh, uh, animals, not only in the marine environment, but also um, uh, in other uh, kind of scenarios. Um, going on with my studies, uh, when I arrived to my uh, master degree and so my master thesis, I decided to uh, continue to study chemical pollution because I was really, really passionate about that. I wanted to understand specifically the effects of this kind of uh, threat. And so I uh, moved to uh, Norway at University of Science and Technology of Trondheim in Norway. And uh, over there, I specifically studied a, a group of these chemicals called endocrine disruptors. I know it's a really, really bad word, <laughs> but uh, basically those group of compounds are able to disrupt, so disturb the endocrine system, so the hormone system. And it, this because uh, uh, if we are going to look a little bit into the chemical structure of these uh, compounds, uh, you can see here on the left, um, the, the, the estradiol is a, a, no, a natural hormone that we produce as a humans and also many marine animals produce. Uh, the nonifenol, for example, is a really toxic compound that uh, has a really similar structure to the estradiol. So um, when these uh, kind of chemicals enter the body, they are able to mimic the action of the hormones. And so they are able to disrupt and disturb all the hormonal system. And um, yeah, I was like super interested in understanding the mechanism of action of these compounds. And uh, like, I was in Norway, so of course I couldn't choose a better uh, experimental model as the Atlantic salmon. And so this experience in Norway actually, um, uh, like, let me jump into the real researcher life because it was an experimental project. And so I really, really loved I, At that point, uh, it was uh, a bit clearer in my mind what my career uh, should have been. And so that's why I decided to like um, continue with the research and uh, I applied for a PhD uh, course uh, in Italy at University of Camerino. And uh, in this, during my uh, doctoral studies, I was able to continue to study the endocrine disruptors. So these chemicals that are, are like toxic and able to disrupt the hormonal system. But I was also able to do uh, many, many other activities over there because the department where I was working has a head uh, sea turtle first aid facilities. So I was also involved in this other super interesting um, uh, aspect. So saving sea turtles, uh, maybe during the winter uh, when the cold, uh, um, the cold weather and the the rush sea uh, basically um, led them strand along the beach, uh, or sometimes they get uh, caught by catch uh, by the fishermen. So we saved this turtle. And during the summer, uh, so the warmer uh, temperature of the sea, we used to release them uh, uh, to and to free them uh, uh, in their natural environment. Um, after the, my dot doctoral uh, studies, um, I really wanted to continue in the research. I know in Italy, it's not so easy to um, enter in the research career, uh, but I really wanted to try 
Uh, and so I started to write project uh, and I also wanted to, like I said, continue to study the chemical pollution and its effect on, on marine life. At that time, there was also another emerging uh, aspect that was uh, threatening the marine environment. And I'm talking about the microplastics. So microplastics are basically um, really tiny plastic particles that are smaller than five millimeters. Uh, so this means that uh, the majority of microplastics are actually invisible to human eyes. Only the largest particle, like the, between one and five millimeter, are actually visible. And uh, this uh, kind of pollution is uh, threatening our ocean because uh, the concentration of these tiny uh, pieces, fragments, are increasing every, every year more. Um, and I used to study this mechanism in the Mediterranean Sea, and I mean, we can find microplastic all over the planet, actually, all in every ocean. But uh, uh, in the, the Mediterranean Sea is particularly vulnerable because uh, it's a really enclosed sea with a low um, uh, exchange of the water uh, with the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, there is a um, uh, there is it is particularly threatened by uh, the accumulation of microplastics in the waters. So uh, my intention in this project was to understand which is which was the role of microplastics are uh, as a carrier of chemical contaminants. Indeed, uh, microplastics are able to attract on their surface, all these toxic compounds that I was telling you before, uh, also the endocrine disruptors. So basically, these, uh, chemical, these microplastics, when they travel along the sea and they are also able to be ingested by many animals, bring all these chemical inside the body. And uh, so my aim was to understand better which was this mechanism and uh, uh, why um, uh, and how um, this uh, uh, situation was threatening the marine life. So I did my um, my research along the Adriatic Sea, exactly in the place where I was born and I grew up. Uh, yeah, you can see here um, um, the, the manta thrall, so an instrument that I used uh, uh, on the sea for collecting microplastics from uh, the surface seawater. So this project was actually supported by the National Geographic Society, and I was so glad and so lucky to uh, become a National Geographic Explorer and to enter the international community of the explorers. And so this allowed me to make a lot of friends, a lot of to know a lot of colleagues, to, to make literally network. Um, and um, it was, yeah, it is actually. I'm still an explorer and I'm still collaborating with many explore, explorers all around the planet. And for the same project, I was actually also awarded uh, a Sky Ocean Rescue Scholar. Indeed, Sky, that is a really, really uh, well known uh, media company in Europe, uh, opened an ocean rescue, um, a Sky Ocean Rescue campaign for protecting the ocean from plastic pollution and chemical pollution and, and pollution in general. So uh, they choose me and other two girls, Imogen Napper and uh, um, Annette Fayet, for like has the three scholars of this uh, campaign. Um, so continuing my career and my life uh, when this National Geographic project, uh, research project uh, actually ended, I was actually looking for a real job. I wanted to do an, uh, um, an experience abroad, but also um, like try to uh, change a little bit uh, my, my research focus. Uh, because, you know, in your career, it's always good to uh, uh, see other kind of approaches, uh, see how um, other groups uh, are facing 
uh, studying certain problems. So I applied for a position uh, uh, in USA and I got the job. So I'm currently still here as a postdoc researcher, uh, specifically in uh, at University of Connecticut. But uh, um, this project I'm currently involved in as a is a as an international collaboration with uh, an Israeli group. Uh, indeed, before actually moving to US, I was in Israel. I went to dive uh, in the Mediterranean side and in the Red Sea side of the Israeli coast to uh, study suspension feeders and most importantly to learn how to um, sample uh, the, the the water flow of these uh, of these animals. It is a really really cool technique. I'm gonna show you later uh, what uh, is about. Uh, and basically, what I've learned in in Israel, I then applied in USA in uh, suspension feeders that are characteristic of the North Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but what are suspension feeders? Uh, suspension feeders are um, aquatic animals that are able to feed filtering seawater. Many of them are also called filter feeders. So basically, um, they, for example, on the top right, you can see a muscle, a blue muscle. Uh, you, if you see these two uh, red arrow, um, in, um, the, the, they basically um, inhale the water inside their body through this uh, aperture over here. They filter the water with all the plankton and all the plankton that are present in the, uh, in the, in the marine water. And they ex exhale, so expel the cleared water outside through this other siphon. And um, so this is the mechanism of feeding. So my aim in this project was to study this mechanism. On the top, you can see two muscles I, uh, I am working on, uh, the blue muscle and the red muscle. The red muscle specifically is from a salt marsh. So if you recall, uh, the picture of me over here while I was sampling during the winter, uh, this is a, a salt marsh that uh, is characteristic of the New England uh, coast. And so this muscle, the rib muscle, is specifically um, inhabiting the community uh, in these salt marshes. But I also uh, study another group of uh, marine invertebrates called sea squirts, and specifically the vast tunicate and the club tunicate. They are also really curious, and I'm happy to show you today because uh, almost nobody, apart from the scientists, know of the existence of these animals. So today I hope that I shared a bit more about the, the invertebrate biodiversity. And so also in this case, uh, the sea squirts are able to, even if they are different from muscles, uh, they are able to inhale the water inside their body, filter of the particles and exhale the water uh, outside. Uh, so my aim in this case was to uh, like uh, detect what they were like inhaling and what they are exhaling because I wanted I was really curious to see what they are actually ingesting, uh, what they are eating basically, and I learned this uh, really cool technique. I basically put this little two tiny tubes in front of the aperture and the siphons of the muscles and of the ascidians. And uh, uh, I collected the uh, water that were they were using for filtering in this special vial. And uh, all these happen underwater. So um, it was pretty tricky, <laughs> of course, uh, for this, uh, also for this reason. And uh, this, uh, pro I'm currently working on this project. So, and uh, it is, yeah, really curious and uh, also really important from an ecological point of view because this filtration that uh, they are doing uh, can also affect uh, the biodiversity and the concentration of the little particle of the plankton. So these uh, animals, even if even if they live attached to a surface for the entire life. And so even if they don't swim around, they are able to affect the, the marine environment. So um, uh, like I said, I'm currently working on this project, but I'm about to end. And my aim is to try to find a, 
uh, uh, point for connecting this approach that, as you can see, is completely different from the approach that I was studying uh, back in Italy um, uh, with the, 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 the marine pollution. So, yeah, I hope that my career will allow me to like find uh, a meeting point between two uh, really different fields of the marine biologists. Um, I'm. Uh, I don't want to go over and don't uh, um, steal more time for uh, any questions. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, Joe, are you there? All right. Hey, Martina. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for that great presentation today. Uh, you know, one thing that I noticed from 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 your presentation is that science really is kind of a ticket to kind of see the world in a lot of cases, to to meet new people, explore exciting places, and it seems like science has really done that for you. Absolutely, I'm. Uh, uh, I love this job not just because I'm passionate about the marine environment, but also because it's uh, really, really dynamic. Uh, as you can see, I was able to travel. I was able to like work underwater, but also marine science work underwater, but also work in the lab. Uh, also work uh, many hours in the computer to analyze the data and writing paper. So it's a really, really dynamic job, and you will never get bored about this job. And also because you know. When you have a project that like uh, you're working on in two or three years uh, after that the project ends so you have to start another project so um, it's even dynamic in the in the long term not just in the short term awesome all right well let's start grabbing some questions here so first of all what brought you to ocean science what hooked you and brought you into the ocean yeah, so like I said, I always had a special passion for the sea, for the uh, aquatic environment, uh, and uh, but I actually decided to enter in this uh, uh, field when I was a teenager. Like I said, when I started to scuba dive, uh, guys, I have to tell you, when you go underwater, you literally are like fascinated by what's over there like seeing all the life that is swimming that is living the interaction between animals so i was yeah literally like <laughs> uh, trapped by this uh the, the the beauty of the life so this was the spark like i said that helped me to figure out what what was my path my future path yeah i think that's how I try to describe the underwater world to people is you can go for a walk in a forest and, you know, you, you, you see some things like birds and insects and mammals, but sometimes it's fleeting. They disappear really quickly. <laughs> uh, it's spread out. You're lucky if you get to see a few things. But when you're underwater, you are surrounded by an incredible uh, amount of life. It is so different uh, than being on land. So I really encourage people like Sylvia Earle said uh, uh, last night to just put a mask on and stick your face in the water. Yes. And just, just see what you see. Yeah, agreed. Indeed, it's also like heartbreaking to see, uh, for example, marine debris. Uh, the breeze mm -hmm. that are like, you, you know, maybe it's a bottle or it's a plastic cap. You know that is that come from human actions and they end up to the ocean and they are yeah. like literally threatening marine life. So yeah, when you go underwater and, and see these scenarios in front of your eyes, I say, oh my God, what are we doing to our planet? Absolutely, absolutely. So filter feeders is what you're, the group you're looking at now. And I think, you know, a, a lot of people maybe overlook filter feeders or some people just see them in the sense that, you know, like mussels or clams on your plate. So yes. why should we be paying a little more attention to the filter feeders? Absolutely. And they are really, really curious animals. So I actually used to study uh, mussels in the past with chemical, when I study chemical pollution, because uh, mussels, for example, are excellent bio indicator of the health of the ocean, because they are able to accumulate inside their body, inside the tissue, all these chemical compounds, the toxic compound I was uh, like told, telling you about. Uh, and so with this project, like I said, I was able to study muscles from another point of view, and they are really, really curious. Like I said, they, um, I show you only, only 
some picture. We don't have uh, like a huge amount of hours, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, they feed uh, uh, and sometimes uh, they are like really open. I'm, uh, so you can see the, the inhaler aperture that they use to inhale water that is really open. You are even able to see the gills sometimes when you look at them. And so it's, uh, it's incredible. We sometimes, yeah, like you said, Joe, sometimes we think about mussels just in a plate with pasta, but actually they are really, really cute curious animal and when you think that mussels like by selecting and capturing and choosing what they want to ingest so what they want to eat they are affecting the biodiversity of the plankton so plankton they basically feed on invisible cells invisible particles that are in the ocean uh the plankton uh, so in the plankton we can find bacteria we can find macroalgae uh, protozoa uh, or the larvae of some other uh, kind of organisms, uh, um, and but they, like I said, they are invisible to human eye. Is to human eyes. So uh, they are able to detect these really, really tiny particles uh, and see, okay, I like these cells, so I want to ingest it. Okay, I don't like these cells, so I want to um, I want to get rid of it. Uh, and so this, uh, I think, is a really curious mechanism because uh, Sometimes when, when we think to fil filter feeders, we think about like just a sieve. So whatever passed through the sieve is uh, detected, whatever is smaller than the, the mesh is like um, pushed away. But actually in the suspension feeders is not. Uh, they are able to like even detect even even if they are like particles cells that are really really small like bacteria and that and these bacteria that are able to escape the mesh size of the filter uh, actually they are retained because probably the muscle or the ascidians the the tunicates uh, want to eat it because maybe uh, they like for certain reason um, indeed uh, for this reason they are called uh, um, uh, biological filters, not just filters, uh, in, for, for this reason. So my mechanism here, my study here is to understand the mechanism behind this process. Uh, Joe, I can There we go. Okay. Uh, to squeeze in one more question, uh, if you can sum it up for us in about a minute, which might be hard, but the filter feeders, they are filtering the water, the microplastics uh, are potentially being ingested, toxins in the water. Are we seeing any evidence that that's having an impact on us when we consume? Um, it's a super, super interesting question. Uh, so there are many evidence that uh, suspension feeders ingest microplastics and microfibers from the ocean. But the interesting thing is that uh, these animals are able to expel the microplastics. Okay. Too. So uh, there is a really tiny, tiny amount of microplastics that are actually retained inside the animals. So, um, and there's a, an, an important message to send because sometimes we think about muscles are like accumulator of uh, these particles, but actually they are a great accumulator of chemicals that are like, from a size point of view, really, really tiny. They are molecules, basically. And this because chemicals are able to accumulate inside the tissue. But microplastics are like, even if they are still invisible, are still larger than a chemical compound. And so it has been demonstrated also my, from my colleague here at University of Connecticut that uh, these, um, these particles uh, are like ingested, but also adjusted through the feces. Okay, very cool. Well, Martina, I want to share a banner here. Let's get that up there. If people would like to follow along, learn more about uh, yourself and the work you're doing, they can find you on Twitter. They can find you on Instagram, uh, so great places to follow along. Martina, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your passion for the ocean and filter feeders in particular uh, right now. And uh, yeah, it sounds like the work is, there's still lots to do. So uh, we look forward to catching up and finding out how things are going down the line. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, Joel. Awesome. Bye. Thanks, Martina. Have a great weekend. You too.